Thank you, Token Galleries, for inviting me. Um, there's been a lot of talk about collaboration um, between galleries as a way to overcome the situation that a lot of mid-tier, mid-size, mid-level galleries are uh, facing. And I think hopefully in this panel we'll be able to get into a bit more detail as to what do we mean by collaboration between galleries and what shape and form could these collaborations take and are taking already. So I'm delighted to have a very interesting panel of speakers who do different things, um, but they do share an interest in collaboration. So first we have Vanessa Carlos, who is the founder and director of the London Gallery Colors of Chicago, which represents artists like Oscar Murillo, Pilby Takala, and Lloyd Corporation, among others. Vanessa, crucially to this panel, she is the founder of Condo, which is a non-profit collaborative, initi non collaborative initiative launched in 2016 in London, which is now expanded, and she will tell us about it. Um, then we have Elizabeth D, who is the founder and director of Elizabeth D, Elizabeth D Gallery in New York, and she represents artists like John Giorno, Adrian Piper, and Derek German, Ryan Tricartin, among others. Elizabeth is also the founder and CEO of the gallery-led Independent Art Fair, which launched in New York in 2009 and then expanded to Brussels, and she's gonna tell us all about it in a minute. And then we have next to me John Martin, who's been director of the John Martin Gallery for 25 years. Um, he was a co-founder and fair director of Art Dubai between 2007 and 2009. He's a founder and board member of Mayfair Art Weekend. He's crucial to this panel, the founder of Cromwell Place, which is a new hub uh, in London, where international and UK-based galleries and curators and institutions will be able to rent spaces. Uh, Cromwell Place is scheduled to open in 2019, and John is going to tell us um, about it in, in a while. So first, I think Condo is, is a very um, well-known new collaborative model. It's got a lot of coverage and critical acclaim. And so Vanessa, can you tell us about um, how Condo came into being? What were your thoughts at the time? And um, yeah, so Condo is a, a project I started where host galleries of a city share their spaces with visiting international galleries. So that can mean you know curating a show together or dividing your space up and offering another gallery um, to have an exhibition in there. And it's an exhibition, it's on for a month. Um, and it started from this frustration of uh, you know, this idea of like, creating the world you want to live in. So um, I always say this, but I, I feel frustrated at how the art world mimics the structure of the world at large. It's become this microcosm of this like neoliberal like, pyramid structure where everything points towards corporations and anything that's not functioning like a corporation is being squeezed. Um, and I thought, you know, in the world at large, how do independents survive? They act collectively and they collaborate. And it was very much this idea of... Um, trying to speak to that, trying to, you know, there's these inherited models that galleries have that functioned in the 90s, but they don't feel like they function anymore. So it's like, how can we try and propose something, um, a different way of showing internationally that isn't what's been kind of handed over to us? Um, so that's how it started. And um, there is this oversimplification in the press sometimes about Condo that it's... Uh, it's about like young to mid-sized galleries like fighting back at art fairs and like it, it really isn't. I think of course there is some kind of conversation that relates to art fairs in a project like that, but I think art fairs are essential, especially, you know, really good ones that deliver, you know, like art basels or whatever. But the problem I do think is that there is a there is an overproliferation of fairs and what that has caused is um in cities like London, I don't think in New York as much, but uh, a gallery going culture has all but disappeared. Um, so you have people who flock to whatever art fair, pay a fortune to get in, then they blast down corridors, kind of just like turning their heads as they go to like glance at some art. And I think that um, Condo aims to create this almost like festival of galleries where there's been a number of galleries filtered down, but that's really about a slower way of looking a slower way of talking about a project with your artist, a slower way of engaging with people when they come and just really encouraging like uh, a gallery going culture again. Um, and this remains to be seen, but I hope that it means that galleries can be more experimental in these projects uh, in how they show internationally because the costs are much less prohibitive than uh, doing an art fair. So you'd hope that that could become a place for taking risks. 
Um, so it's happened in London three times now. It's currently on right now. And then um, New York did Condo last year in the summer, and uh, we'll do it again this year. And now we're also starting in Shanghai um, and Mexico City. And the last thing I wanted to say about Condo is that it's certainly primarily geared towards younger galleries because I think that they're the ones that have to deal with a lot of this more, but it's by all means not uh, reduced to like younger galleries only. We have some really big galleries that do it like Sadie Coles and Gavin Brown and Shang Art and Shanghai. And for me, it's much more about galleries that no matter how successful they are and how big they get, that they um, have a certain ethos about how they operate. So someone like Sadie Coles has never become a corporation, you know, even though she's like one of the biggest galleries in London. Thank you. Elizabeth? <coughs> so I'm going to show a, a little bit of the timeline and evolution of independent uh, from 2010 to now. Uh, we're entering our ninth year. And uh, this project began out of a really deep desire to uh, take back the gallery marketplace uh, from the larger fairs that we were all participating in as emerging and uh, galleries at the time, 10 years ago. And that became a really great opportunity to collaborate with colleagues. And the conversation, I always feel like I'm my role as a founder uh, with others was really just to be a facilitator to the, something that was already <coughs> being discussed, already being driven, uh, and there was just no way to, to kind of demonstrate and incubate these ideas. And, and so we had an opportunity to take the Dia Center for the Arts in 2010. And that allowed for uh, a rare opportunity to occupy a museum independently with galleries that are single owner operator galleries, uh, primarily discussing what does, an, what does an exhibition model look like? How do we bring the culture of the gallery into a fair context? How do we take what works for fairs, bring that in, and what is working for the biennial culture, and bring that in, and combine that with a kind of larger platform? So using the economies of scale to the benefit of each individual small, growing, developing gallery that has developing artists that they need to have longer, more sustained conversations uh, about, about the curatorial nature of these artists and how important they are for the programs that are representing them. I'm going to flip through. This is a presentation that uh, has multiple purposes, so not all of it's going to be relevant. Um, but this is our mission statement, and this is inherently what we've been trying to do from day one, the core values of uh, gallery uh, tradition, which is a European tradition, an American tradition, has, you know, in our mind, really the idea of taking artists and, and bringing them from one place to another through the fostering of communities and context and patronage around their work and forming those communities with other galleries, with other institutions, having a balance between the art marketplace, which is gallery, the gallery sales that occur to keep these artists going and the gallery going, and the institutional uh, support, which we find equally meaningful for the development of the artist's careers. This is a image of a project. Well, actually, I'll come back to that. So here's the timeline. Um, we began in 2009. Uh, we went to the DIA building. Uh, then we ended up uh, in New York, is, as you know, an extraordinarily expensive place to do business. Uh, we have <laughs> been very transparent about our model of organizing the fair. Uh, it is really essentially meant to uh, cost as little as possible. So our biggest cost is always the rent. <laughs> we were very lucky when we first started in that we had a building that was first donated to us and then incrementally became a rental building for us and was eventually a development property which sold. So upon the sale of, of our building, we ended up moving to a new location, uh, which is pretty much the only museum quality space with natural light in Manhattan uh, called Spring Studios, which is uh, a building that is in Tribeca and has allowed us to be in proximity to the galleries of Tribeca, the new museum, uh, the Whitney, and in close proximity to Chelsea and Lower East Side galleries. When we um, made the move to Spring, we also decided to think through the possibility of returning 
uh, our gratitude to the European galleries that had been coming to New York all the way back to in 2009, in 2010, discussing this project with us. We felt that the European galleries really made independent New York a success. Um, they weren't showing their artists, their artists weren't represented by galleries in New York. Uh, there were, you know, there were galleries like Maureen Paley, who's been a really key supporter of independent, who, uh, you know, had not been to the Armory Show in years as an exhibitor, um, had artists that didn't have representation in New York. And so these were, what we were able to do was to provide a fresh look at an entire European generation that was coming up that had no voice in New York at the time. And so that was really an important thing for us. So to thank the European galleries for being a part of New York and investing in us and us investing in them, we wanted to ret basically return a model and do a, a partnership with the city of Brussels. Um, we felt that was really in the spirit of the European community. Uh, we have a wonderful relationship with the city of Brussels that emerged in 2015. Uh, we have a very economical situation with our real estate there, which allows us to make the prices extremely affordable for even the most emerging galleries. We can be their first fair. Um, and still we have the support of major galleries that are very established that have been coming in and out of our rotation uh, throughout the course of the nine years. This is uh, the original Dia. Uh, you can see the Jorge Pardo floor was still there. Uh, we had the Dan Flavins in the stairwell. And um, this is our mission statement and our manifesto that we made together and put on the front wall when you first walked in. And I like to refer to this uh, every year to say, are we on track? You know, our circumstances have evolved. Uh, some are in our control as a community uh, of galleries. Some are not, like real estate and the cost of living. But at the end of the day, are we really staying true to our core values? And is that supporting the galleries? Because we need to be advocating for, for their rights and the rights of their artists. I'm gonna, this is a picture of the DIA building from the outside, so you can see where we started. And I'm going to take you through sort of the evolution of what the exhibition looked like, or the, the fair looked like. This was our first fair. As you can see, we had very little uh, to work with. Uh, we all came with great work. Uh, we didn't build a lot of walls. Uh, it was sometimes confusing and sometimes really exciting to see that. Uh, and we did a lot of first uh, uh, artist solo uh, projects that went on to become quite you know, recognized in the global landscape. So it was a very important year for us to kind of break ground and to see what the feedback was. And when we did this in 2010, we actually didn't know if we would do it again. The idea was let's put something out there as an offering for discussion and feedback. And if it works, perhaps we'll continue. But it wasn't, there was no goal to become an art fair, an art fair corporation, or anything that resembled the kind of institutions that we were already affiliating with that did that very, very well. We were trying to kind of work within the territories uh, of opportunity. Once people come and they are coming back for the second time, or once people see these exhibitions and these presentations by the galleries, they start to get ideas and say, what, how, Actually, next year I know exactly how I'm going to address that space. I might build a wall. I might bring more specific material. I might have a more contextualized view. And so this becomes um, an opportunity to kind of develop the project more in collaboration with the galleries. I'll just run through so you can see how the evolution. So recognize somebody? <laughs> <laughs> this was made a while ago. <laughs> and then uh, I'll just be, I'll, I'll close it down, but I just wanted to also say that um, in 2014, we decided to try and take ourselves out of the picture and just do solo shows, uh, have an opening weekend the way you would a fair, but then evacuate the space and let people see the work on its own terms that is curated by the galleries. And so we had two weekends where people can roam free in the entire building as if they were in a museum. And it was a really special project and something we would love to do again. Um, and we haven't had the opportunity to, to find the right space and the right circumstance to do it. This is our venue now. It's our first year. And last year, our, our second year. 
Um, I'll just, and this is our building in uh, Brussels with our partnership with the city. And this is our first year in 2016 and our second year. And I'll end there. Um, I think we should talk about what you're doing with Regions in Brussels. Oh, I'm in sorry. Brussels. Yes. Yeah. Before we pass on to John, can you tell us a little yes. bit? Yes. Um, there was a picture of kind of an open vaulted space with skylights. I don't know if you remember, it was like the second slide uh, behind some text. Um, we, when we decided to come to Belgium, one of the things we really wanted to decide was how to integrate ourselves with the local community. And we didn't want to be a New York fair just coming in. We really wanted to foster um, a root system uh, with not only the local galleries, but also to, to invite galleries that maybe you know, we were starting to see a shift in the fair, in the landscape of fairs and galleries feeling a lot of stress and strain in doing these fairs. And we wanted to support changes in the system. So we, what we decided to do was to take on and subsidize ourselves a, um, a Regence space, which was a space in a gallery building that had Jan Mott, Catherine Bastide, De Vere, uh, Micheline Schweitzer, Sorry We Are Closed, and um, several other galleries. And it was really a nice gallery building in Brussels. So we took the, the kind of clubhouse at the top. We made a, uh, an apartment, a catering kitchen, and three galleries there. And what we thought would be helpful is for galleries that, A, maybe just felt like they don't have a huge Belgian market support for their program, but they'd like to build ties in that territory for them to come and stay for a month and to do an exhibition. And the price of that would be a fraction of doing a fair. Um, so the shipping becomes more manageable when you know you have 30 days to kind of cultivate you know, walkthroughs of the exhibition of, with the artist, with the, with the audience that you're targeting. Um, and also we wanted to really ensure that they were only artists that had no representation in Belgium. So we did a lot of Belgian debuts. Uh, our first gallery that, that did that project was The Approach with a, a beautiful show of sculpture never before shown in Belgium of John Stesiger. Um, we have worked with so many great galleries uh, from all over the world over the course of three years. And now we are uh, rethinking that project for the future uh, and trying to kind of take it. The building itself has stopped becoming a gallery building in those three years. A lot of changes uh, took place there. So we have concluded our time there and now working with the city to occupy different buildings at different times of the year so people go through the city of Brussels and have these experiences and allows us to maybe work with four or five galleries at one time rather than you know having, having the the idea and approach have to fit into a specific gallery structure. So we're just trying to be as fluid as we can in addressing the, uh, the interests of galleries spending time in Brussels and exposing artists that have never been shown in Belgium before. Great. Thank you, Elizabeth. We'll come back to that. But John, tell us about Cromwell Place. Yeah, so I'll, I'll just give you a bit of background to, that, to, the, to the project or what initiated it. It's very similar to some of the background that Vanessa was talking about in London. Um, so I, I, I've had a gallery for 25 years, as you said, and I also ran an art fair. So when I left the fair and just came back to my gallery, I think it was, you know, I loved my gallery, I loved working with my artists, but it was in exactly the environment that Vanessa's talking about, where no longer were we seeing people coming in. There wasn't the buzz or the excitement over, uh, over private views or receptions. It was really difficult getting people in, and I was on a ground floor gallery. And um, in, in Mayfair, I mean, it was, it, was, uh, it was frustrating. And meanwhile, from my art fair hat, I saw that the public loved art fairs, and it was inescapable. And, um, you know, they were fun, they were accessible, they were convenient, they were social, uh, lively. And yet, so they loved them, and they were a great and very necessary part of the business for any gallery but we all have a kind of love-hate relationship with them because I just don't think, as a gallerist, they really reflect me or my artists. I find them, uh, worse, a little bit superficial. Uh, I, as a small to mid-sized <laughs> gallery, uh, you know, you're parked in some far corner mm. <laughs> of the fair and you're kind of exposing yourself to this hierarchy. So you've already, you've already, by just taking part in the fair, being positioned in a bad place, you're kind of assuming, you're sort of saying, I'm not actually mid-tier, I'm somewhere lower, somewhere <laughs> down here. And, you know, it doesn't really help. It's not, you know, 15 years ago, we were just galleries. There weren't tiers. 
of galleries. We were just galleries, and people came to galleries. And I love and the other thing you said about slow, slowing the whole pace down, the frenetic chasing of fairs. And I think that gal trying to sell space as a fair director to galleries, you realize that galleries are getting more and more fed up with fairs. And so too were collectors, weirdly. And yet they weren't coming to the galleries. And, and it was a conundrum, and clearly it was never going to change. There was not very much one could do to get people back into the galleries. Um, uh, but we were all thinking about ways we could kind of present it in a more uh, accessible way. And I suppose, like a lot of galleries, started thinking of a kind of hybrid model. For me, it was something like, the f in London, it was looking at something like the Fuller Building in New York, where you can get galleries together sharing the exhibition space, uh, therefore keeping that kind of momentum going so you can be open in the evenings and at weekends and you're going to get more people coming through. So you create actually a really good destination rather than a kind of splintered destination, which is what Mayfair is, which has got 200 galleries. But in order for that to work, you needed to have a kind of collective willpower to kind of move all these galleries into this... Um, place which you know, you've achieved with Condo, um, but for this would require a lot of galleries suddenly moving. And the trigger for us, uh, for this idea, was um, were rents in Mayfair. I mean, all galleries are going through, around the world are going through, rents are an issue, particularly when galleries are becoming unsustainable uh, and not attracting the visitors that they used to. But in Mayfair, it was particularly acute because the London, the UK system means that rents only ever go up and they go up every five years and they're based on something called market value. And so in my particular case, and I have no, um, <laughs> I don't resent her, but Vanessa, <laughs> um, um, Victoria Beckham <laughs> moved into Dover Street and I think she paid a kind of record rent for that shop then. I mean, if it wasn't her, it would have been someone else, but it was five times what I was paying and that became the benchmark. So it was inevitable that my rent of 70, 80,000 pounds was going to be somewhere in the region of 300 to 400,000 pounds a year. And then two years later, the rates were going to go up on top. So it was, a f you know, it was like a, a, you know, I was just going very fast into a brick wall. And I went and then saw some property people just saying, it's not just going to happen to me. There are 200 galleries, probably half of whom are on ground, you know, will. At some point between 2011 and 2016, we'll have a rent review because that's the five-year kind of cycle. At some point, they're going to come along. Their landlords are going to send them a rent demand that will be three or four times what they're paying. And, and, and I said, look, this is a real moment to do this kind of fuller building type model in London. And I was very lucky. I'm, I, I met Scott Murdoch, who's one of our directors, and Sir Stuart Lipton, who gave us a gave me a lot of advice and help over looking for a building, um, because they don't just come in from estate agents. <laughs> you know. And I was sent to South Kensington. We looked, spent six months looking. And then Scott said, well, there's, I know someone, Toby Anstruther, South Kensington Estates. They've got some lovely old buildings in South Ken. Would you ever consider South Kensington? And actually, um, it, you know, and it's here. And so I, I kind of went to, went along thinking that, that this was just a series of old houses, but it was the entire street. It was this stunning standalone terrace of six houses built in 1870. Um, at one end, the, 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 the number five Cromwell Place was built for um, uh, Sir Coots Lindsay, who founded the Grosvenor Gallery. And next door to it, then it was taken over by Sir John Lavery, and he, in number four, this was his house. It's got the most spectacular um, uh, interior. Just to show you the location, um, here's South Kent Tube Station. Uh, there's Heathrow Airport, just down there. There's the Victoria and Albert Museum and the Natural History Museum. It's mm. an incredibly accessible place. And it's not just the front, it's the entire island site. So it's the original gardens and the muse behind. Um, so we're working with a really stunning, beautiful historical building. This is inside number five. This was the, what was Lavery's studio um, with large windows. It's, it's actually eight meters high, this. I mean, it's vast space, beautiful, beautiful space. Um, one of the largest sash windows, I think, in London. <laughs> and next door, L Lavery put in um, a very grand salon. 
um, with floor-to-ceiling mirrors and this rather wonderful stucco work. It's grade two listed, so we couldn't do anything with it, but wonderful place for talks as a meeting room. And it's so simply walking in there that you suddenly go, well, why don't we just sort of have it like a kind of club thing? You know, this would be great for galleries, that they can meet there, take clients there, and socialise with each other. Um, so how, how many galleries, how many spaces? How many spaces? Well, across, so, so it breaks down. What I was looking for is something where galleries could have offices permanently, so they're on five-year leases. The top two floors were perfect for that. They were the old bedrooms. So galleries don't, smaller galleries don't really need a huge amount of office space, but they need a permanent address. So there are about 25 offices we've put, we're using, but they can be configured in different ways, and we're talking to galleries at the moment about how they want to use them. Um, and at one end, we're putting in a sort of hot desk, so galleries can then just use it for a day at a time. Um, and then the ground first and second floor have these beautiful high ceilings, 13-foot, uh, ceilings in, on the first floor, uh, slightly lower on the third floor, but they're lovely spaces. They're sort of 60 square meters, balconies, lovely, incredible light. Um, and so we were uh, asked to do a feasibility study. So we had the bare bones of this rather beautiful building, which, which uh, uh, you know, it's similar sort of feel to David's Werner's Gallery in Dover Street in the proportions and these very elegant rooms. Um, but what it was lacking was storage space and, and some of the, um, and trying to connect all the different rooms. So otherwise, everyone would be coming in and out of every single building. Mm. So the gardens came to the rescue here. So what we did was um, we connected, I don't know if you can see, against the, leaning against the building is a walkway that goes the whole length of the building. So once you're through one of the front doors, you can walk through the gallery on ground floor, and then you, you can navigate your way along quite easily along the back. Um, the gardens, in the 80s, these have been filled in with offices. We're removing that at the moment, digging that all out, um, which you know, took a lot of planning and persuading the council over uh, this. But they were very supportive in the end. Um, if, I, if you look through it, We've got a, we're putting in a plant room there that will make it kind of climate controlled. There will be a 2,500 square foot storage unit, which will be maintained by a team of technicians and storage people. The idea of this is that that's the thing that every single gallery needs. There isn't anything like this in the centre of London. So we're also talking to just secondary market dealers who can use it as a, as a place to show clients. So in the basement behind that, towards the street, there will be six viewing rooms. So it is beautiful, but it sounds expensive. It is, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it is. I mean, above that, you've got this pavilion gallery with north-facing louvered lights. This is kind of music. We talked to insurers and museums to make sure that if a institution wanted to do something amazing in there, it would, uh, they would all be happy. So they can take four tons. Um, there's the natural lux, uh, the, uh, lux levels can be uh, adjusted, and it can be completely modified. So that's the modern bit of it. Um, that's looking it through the other way. Um, and that's looking down the walkway. And that's a, a sort of architect's render of the courtyard space leading into this large pavilion gallery. So who, who are your targets? Who's going to rent these spaces? Um, it's it's um, uh, we're to at the moment, we're talking to, I mean, predominantly the people applying are galleries. Um, I mean, what we're trying to do is, is provide the most amazing facilities. Um, I mean, this is a £20 million project, and we're giving galleries access to that incredible space and services by consolidating everything, by having marketing teams on site, tech teams on site, by doing a lot... Of, we're developing an app that goes with it, so visitors can use that to navigate their way around the space. So these are sort of things that not only are we providing the services and the facilities that only the best galleries could ever afford, the biggest galleries, but we're also adding additional things in using technology. And um, there's catering on site. Uh, so if you want to do events, it's all quite easy. Uh, and do you have a, a sort of, do you provide a sort of collector's database? Because if someone was to come and rent a space from abroad, they might not have had exposure in London or local collectors contacts there or something, would you then provide that? 
um, sort of, or do they have to do their own? I think most of the galleries we're talking to uh, want a London presence. They've got their own set of collectors. They're fairly self-sufficient. But inevitably, over the course of the year, we will get visitors. I would have thought most people interested in, in contemporary art or there's some of the other specialities we're looking at bringing there will visit at some point and then mm. and hopefully we'll create um, an environment where they'll keep coming back and the app is really useful because that's your key to get in so and, we'll just, and just going into like the small print like what would be the prices how long can these galleries stay for um, well the offices are less on so so how it works is that you join as a member and you there's a joining fee and then an annual fee which covers the marketing costs essentially for us. So that's about, joining fee is £3,000. And then you pay, uh, if you're going to be a resident there, doing a lot of exhibitions, it's £5,000 a year. And then if you're uh, an international member, you pay about £2,000 a year. And for non-exhibiting members, so people just using the storage facilities and the viewing rooms, uh, I think it's a bit less than that, it's sort of £1,500 a year. And the space? And then the each space, it varies. It's a bit like a kind of hotel at different times of the right. year. So at sort of peak times, you know, probably in October, um, it's you'll be paying sort of 80 to 120 pounds a square meter. So, I mean, that's sort of equivalent to an art, art fair, maybe th two, 200, 300, 400 pounds a square meter. But the, so the rooms are a 50 square meter room um, would vary between about £4,000 a week to about £7,000 a week. Wow. So, um, and then there are project spaces on the third floor, which would probably be in the region of £2,000 a week. So um, it's sort of how every gallery wants to use it. It's slightly different. Um, and, and then you, that's all inclusive. So you've got AV, you've got lighting um, equipment. So the galleries we're talking to Originally, as I said, it was a lot of London gal Mayfair galleries looking uh, for another option. And I think that what we ended up with so far is a lot of international galleries that want to come there, you know, looking for a London presence. And, I mean, the cost of putting, you know, doing your own standalone gallery in Mayfair now is, is a fortune. So suddenly, for three thousand pounds, you've got you don't have any upfront costs. You have no lease. You have no obligation. You have no fit-out costs or anything else. You can probably reduce your marketing spend, your um, <coughs> staff. You won't need as I'm, many I'm staff. I'm curious to know what Elizabeth yeah. and Vanessa think about Cromwell Place. <laughs> I mean, you're dealers and you're facing pressures well, for, for rent. Uh, for me, it's more like. Um, I just I think that it's a great idea, but I don't imagine it functioning so much for contemporary art world. I imagine it'll work really well for like antiques dealers or secondary dealers. Um, you know, for me, for example, if we're saying that some of the cheaper rooms are four thousand pounds a week, like so that's like what sixteen thousand a month. Like my rent needs to be seventeen thousand a year. You know, and um, the thing that I always say, and also this whole property development thing in London is part of the reasons why like we can't pay our rents and artists can't pay their studios in the first place. So I'm a bit suspicious about the developers' like long-term vision for that. Although you can't say that South Ken is in danger of being gentrified. Um, and then the last thing that I think is that. Um, this idea of being itinerant, like the reason why I think it works better for secondary dealing and antiques, and I think it'll work brilliantly for that, is um, I always maintain that like when you work with contemporary artists, like maybe only 60% of the work gets made in the studio. Like it tends to not be that you can just like transport a work from a studio, put it in a place, leave. Like the space takes on um, the role of being like the final stage of experimentation for the artists and I think that for that you need to have as little restriction as possible. You can't be necessarily in a great two listed building. You have to be able to drill into the floor, paint the wall green, like you know, you have to be able to do those things and um so I think that it it'll I think it'll work brilliantly but f not for a gallery like me. Mm. I think that there's a lot of opportunity in this post brick and mortar uh territory. And I think we're going to see more and more uh, of a loosening of the boundaries of what it means to be a gallerist. I think there are already people who are contributing to the to the gallery field who have 
retired from gallery work and who are doing it in a different way. You know, it could be Nicole Clagsburn in New York who is still doing great projects. Um, and, you know, I think the, taking back the terms and conditions of what it means to be a gallerist doesn't have to mean going back to the original model that we were all brought up in and all taught, um, of which there's a great value there, but it's not necessarily applicable or possible for everybody uh, to, to kind of just continue in a very uh, linear um, methodology where everybody has a, a space that's open 12 months a year in one city or more, and, that, and they change that you know, gallery space every 10 to 15 years. Um, that, that works on, in a lot of ways, and there are a lot of benefits to, to the model, and I think it really does support artists in a durational sense. But there's also a lot of artists who are really well known in the territory that they have the mother gallery, and they're less known in other areas. And um, it's an opportunity, I think, to as a gallerist to look at artists that you have relationships with and say, you know, I'd love to have you do your third show here at our space, but I also realize you have you have three museum shows happening in London in the coming year, and no, and even though I've I've begun conversations with other galleries about maybe working with you, maybe the way to kind of uh, accelerate that conversation is for us to take a space in London, hmm. and um, I see great benefit to that. Um, I, you know, it's it's a way to kind of look at your. Uh, look at the artists you're working with in a very expansive possibility of, you know, beyond my own brick and mortar. What is out there? There's collaborations, there are colleagues, there are, there are models that are much more fluid and actually a lot that might be expensive at the moment, but they're just like everything. Uh, you know, you're making an investment in that, whether it's in the gallery or in a fair. Um, so it's just a matter of being able to have many, many more options to uh, produce shows and uh, bring reframe the conversation around a practice. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a you know I'm much I'm very open minded to the possibility of of these models working in the future for a lot of people. I'm sort of thinking that there's a lot of conversation about collaboration that mm -hmm. has to do with um, modes of display, so exhibition yeah. making, uh, attending fairs. No, attending fairs are very expensive. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm wondering whether there's something else that we can think in terms of collaboration. There's n it's, it's a different kind of conversation in terms of galleries coming together, maybe having a dialogue with the different segments, you know, yeah. the mega and the mid and the younger, and in terms of a contract of facilitating practices that will enable these galleries mm -hmm. to survive that are not there. So do you have any thoughts about best practices, codes of conduct, you know, preventing the mega galleries from poaching artists that you've nurtured in your galleries? As it relates to collaboration? What do you mean? What do you mean? Just sort of how, how, does, it, how does it link into to the, well, the theme of the Well, I think the galleries talking, yeah. galleries mm -hmm. coming together in ways that are not shows. I mean, yeah. kind of paving the way for an ecosystem that's more sustainable for all the galleries and not just the top tier, that makes sense. I think there's a lot of possibility for, I mean, we're using the word collaboration, but I also think of it as partnership. Um, you know, and, and I think that there's, there's benefit to both, both things. Um, you know, partnership can be uh, with, with a new model. It could be with uh, several other galleries defining a new space elsewhere outside of their home network. You're, you're seeing a lot of that now, and I think that's also a great model. Um, there are lots of, of forms in which um, there's so much opportunity um, to kind of broaden the conversation. Um, and I think as long as it looks outward and is kind of thinking about, you know, the context of, 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 of the projects that, are, that galleries are doing together, what kind of context is, and relevance does that and value does that add to the gallery's uh, visibility and profile? Uh, how does it reframe the conversation around the artist or the artist in conversation with other artists? And then how are we really engaging and growing um, a public? Because um, I think what we're seeing is that the, the community or the audience for the art world feels, it's global, but it also feels very fixed. Um, mm. And we are really needing to kind of make the pie bigger so that there's more space for everybody um, to kind of engage and develop Edu you know, develop an education and, and an intellectual interest in what the artists are doing. Mm -hmm. So any way in which that could be working together on a talk, working together on a performance, 
coming together to a new space that doesn't currently exist in in, in you know your home t in the home you know territory. It's there's so many infinite ways in which partnerships and collaborations can work. Even just co-representing artists is a form of collaboration and a really important strategic form of collaboration. Uh, also, you've, um, you've successfully brought in, I mean, this <coughs> trying to divide the art world between big galleries and, and smaller galleries, mm -hmm. you know, you've successfully brought in some big international galleries into independent who identify themselves with, a, with what you're talking about, this ethos. Yeah. And... Um, Be because it's important to their artists, and yeah. it's important to their, for them to not be over-determined, over-branded uh, as well. And it's important for us to be able to develop a democracy between uh, galleries of all economies and scales, mm. for, to break through that really um, toxic uh, class system in, in, the, in the art world, which I think is really not fostering innovation and talent. And we are just full of great talent and innovation among the gallerists and among the artists. Uh, I was going to say that um, Claire McAndrew, who did the talk on the first day, wrote this really interesting article about the problem of like the superstar um, economy. And I think that like one of the ways that I'd be interested in seeing collaboration among galleries develop is things that you have like in New York, between 47 Canal, which is a very young gallery, and Metro Pictures, which is a more established one. And I don't understand the ins and outs, but as far as I can tell, it's about um, basically Metro Pictures supporting 47 Canal. <laughs> and I think that um, f also from what I read from that uh, article of, um, of Claire's, there is this, um, I think that like bigger galleries, through being so extremely aggressive and the poaching that happens and this kind of thing, lose sight of the fact that like you need in the ecosystem the younger and mid-level galleries to thrive. Otherwise, you're left with nothing. I mean, including artists to poach, like you're yeah. left with nothing. And I think that um, if we don't want to look back in ten years' time and find an extremely homogenous, boring um, art world and artworks, then we have to recognize the importance of supporting. Um, galleries in this other tier who are supporting artists who are in this other tier and maybe one of the ways of doing that is for those galleries who act so aggressively to perhaps think about um, ways that the, and some gallery a lot of galleries do a lot of big galleries are can be extremely generous with like the younger generation but I think that that's one of the key ways that um, and also subsidies like even when we talk about art fairs or Jean-Claude Freeman Guth mentioned in the first day also the way that like the pricing system at Lista works, for example. Like a lot of fairs would argue that younger sectors are already subsidized, but they're like not really. And if you look at the economy of like what the square meterage of a fair costs, what the artworks are costing, like there's a lot that art fairs could do there to help younger galleries. Um, yeah. Are there any other formats of collaboration that you are? interested in? I'm thinking, I don't know, Roberta, Projecto Soleil. <coughs> well, I actually thought I participated at Independent Regence and I thought that that was really exciting and interesting because um, they have a team in-house who have experience working in other galleries. So you come in with your exhibition, um, you're there for the opening, but once you've left, the team is still working on your exhibition. And I did end up meeting a couple of new clients and making a couple of sales. And th I thought that was, because it wasn't like renting a space and then leaving. It was like a support structure within a city that's really like putting you in touch with um, collectors in that city. So I think that's really interesting and there's not much of, I think that's the only one that I know and of. And is that something you think Condo could evolve into? Condo does that naturally because um, we cross pollinate our mailing list. So like we all spam <laughs> our mailing yeah. list with like condos on and then my client maybe never goes to your gallery but they might go for the first time. And um, what's nice is that you just end up introducing each other. So like this week, I sold maybe two or three works for the New York gallery that's being hosted by me. Um, and I don't take a commission because I can't quantify the ways that I'm benefiting from having them in my space either. So um, with Condo, we do that, but we're cutting out like all the middlemen, mm -hmm. basically. We're cutting out everyone and we're just relying on each other for that cross-pollination of our mailing list and those introductions. And can you tell me a little bit about the uh, iteration in Sao Paulo that's going to take a slightly different form than... 
New yeah, York. Yeah, so and... um, Sao Paulo, because it's my hometown, I really wanted the South American condo to be in Sao Paulo, but for many different reasons, we decided it would be better to do it in Mexico City. Um, but there was still uh, interest uh, specifically from Jacqueline Machings, who has participated in quite a few of the different condos. And so we thought that maybe in a city where it doesn't make sense to have this sprawling like festival of exhibitions that is condo, to but there's a building that's big enough. In this case, Jacqueline's has like three floors. Each floor is like, I don't know, 300 square meters or something. So to have five galleries in the building at the same time, and we're calling it like condo unit. So maybe every year in a couple of cities, we do these like mini versions, like maybe we'll do one in LA, but really it wouldn't make sense to have um, as big a project as it will hopefully happen regularly in New York, Shanghai, Mexico. And what London. are the costs of uh, being in... So w for condo, it's always the same. Like the host galleries don't pay anything because they're giving in kind by paying for their rent and their electricity. And uh, the visiting galleries only pay enough to share the cost of the opening party and the website. So the costs tend to be between 650 pounds in America. In New York, it's like $850. So they're just, the visitors are just sharing the promotional costs. Um, the organizers don't take a fee. Um, yeah, it's like entirely not for profit from an organizational point of view. Of course, the ga and then the galleries make their own sales. So if you're being hosted by me and you came for the opening weekend and now you've left and a client comes in, I will literally just like connect you on email and you make your own sale. And in Sao Paulo, would you rent us the space in that building or? No, in Sao Paulo, it's in Jacqueline Machin's gallery space. So it'll work exactly like condo, but okay. all under one roof. Right. Um, and again, the visitors will just share the costs of whatever dinner or party we do. And uh, we'll pay the designer <coughs> to do for the, and then that'll be it. And I think that there's a lot of the fairs. I mean, obviously you organize a fair. Um, so you obviously find a lot of value in that model. But there's a lot of criticisms about all the affairs and the abundance of affairs. And, but I guess there's this sort of other universe of low-cost affairs. Um, I'm thinking, I don't know, Proposicions, Grand Palazzo, Sunday, Par International. Yeah, but they're a waste of money because they don't deliver either. So you're like, you know, I, I was invited to do a fair last year where I got a free hotel, a free booth, and I was like, beautiful, and going. And I still managed to lose money. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> So um, I think, I personally think the future is really big, um, very well put together fairs that deliver. And then a couple of like smaller things that are completely geared to viewing experience. Smaller fairs, smaller projects, and like nothing in between it, for me. Mm -hmm. I think you have to have a point of view in a fair or you lose all context of why you're there. And people lose context of what they should be focusing on. And, you know, you have to slow people down by making it more human. And you have to make it social, mm -hmm. you know. It's, it, that's, that's the thing that we are missing from gallery culture that we need to bring back into fair culture is, is, is the exchange. It's the conversation that inspires and changes the way you, you think about the world because you've just encountered this amazing artist's work and you now understand it in a level you hadn't before. And you know whether it's MoMA coming in and making several acquisitions, uh, which is which is something we're lucky to be able to 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 deliver on for galleries, or um, you know really meeting your clients at a, on a different level where it's less rushed, it's less hurried, and it's less of a less of a uh, souk trading floor, and mm. much more of a, of a place of discussion and debate about the merits of what people are looking at, because we need to get back to that consensus. Without the consensus, um, none of this is possible. But I think one of the things that we're seeing here, particularly since all three of us are committed gallerists as well as doing uh, these, these collaborative projects with galleries, it's, it's that we're really committed to the model, but we're also really committed to sharing how special uh, this opportunity is to be in this seat and to be able to share it with other people. And I think that getting back to the core uh, value of, of everything that we're doing is something we want to be able to do, whether you see me at a fair or you see me in the gallery or you know, I, I've just, you know, helped a museum produce a major exhibition of an artist. You know, you want to have a sort of level quality of discussion, and mm -hmm. we want to reclaim that, and I think that's the, 
and the, the collaborations are already happening. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the thing. I think it's very exciting what's happening because there's a lot more openness between generations and hopefully we can be, just as Vanessa was saying, about the established galleries really kind of fostering the growth of the next generation. We also need to make sure that we have less galleries opening now than ever, uh, according to Claire McAndrews' report uh, yesterday. And I think that's, that's a concern to me, is that, you know, I think we are, our world is shifting so rapidly around us and we're working together on a level we never worked together before. And I think that's exciting. I think I just want to make sure that people see the practice as a viable uh, future to make an impact and be a part of the art historical movement that they're living in. And I think that being able to mentor the younger generation is really going to become an essential discussion point for us because as, mm. as challenging as our world is, we still have, a, we've been through a lot and we have a lot to, to share and I'd love for a gallery coming up to not have to, um, you know, I'd love to save them some headaches, <laughs> if anything, and, and also p provide some opportunities that maybe I didn't have when I was starting out 20 years ago as a gallerist. So um, I'm just going to open the floor for questions and invite questions from the public. <coughs> Vanessa, um, I just want to applaud you because I think Condo is a really amazing model. It's really hard to come up with something innovative where you can kind of hit all the marks. So um, I think it's great to get people to go back to galleries. And then I guess to Vanessa and Elizabeth, if you're talking to younger galleries now, a lot of times I hear the galleries, and again, I'm not a gallerist, so I don't really know the ins and outs, but I hear my friends who have young galleries say, I have to do the fair, and I, I'm always like, don't do the fair. It's too expensive. It's too soon. Is there a time where you feel like galleries should be not trying to do the art fair right away and spending time on their program? Um, I think that, for example, uh, Bridget Donahue in New York is a good example of someone who for the first year or two was like, I'm not going to do many fairs and I'm going to focus on my program and I think that's really worked for her. But um, on the other hand, when you're starting out, like it becomes a way of contextualizing yourself, right? So to be allowed into a certain fair already kind of positions you in a certain way and the artist wants to be positioned in that way. So um, I would like to do, I feel like a gambling addict with fairs because I'm always like, day three of a fair, I'm always like, I hate this, I'm going <laughs> to quit it, I'm going to start making jam, like, screw this. <laughs> and then, you know, then I'll go back home, and then, like, the application starts, and I start getting, like, this FOMO, and I'm like, just one more time. And it's, like, this horrible, like, gambling cycle. And um, I think that uh, you have some galleries, like Cabinet in London, who's an, ex an amazing gallery, and they've just decided to, like, I think they just do Basel now. Mm -hmm. They don't even care. And, and they can do it because they've reached a certain position. So I think that to hold off and have the confidence to like opt out of fairs is amazing. But I also think it's a little bit of a privilege and a luxury. I think that for a young gallery, you, you have to enter that grind. Like you, you, maybe you don't have to. Maybe there's a couple of exceptions. But I feel that to contextualize and position yourself in, in a certain way, like that's when you have to do it. And maybe when you're more established, then you can sit back and be like, I don't need this. Hmm. I think also uh, independent is different in that there's no application process. Uh, we have um, our co-founder, Matthew Higgs, uh, does the invitational for the New York Fair, and Vincent Honoré is our new curator for the Belgian edition who does the invitational. So the discussion, the curatorial meetings that take place are really about, con about, about the artistic content and projects, um, or reaching out to a gallery to start a discussion that main, and the goal of that discussion isn't always do this fair this year. It's, it's you know, we'd like to invite you, do you have a project that you, that you think is ready and to put forward? Um, so there's often that. Um, there's always the question of, would this work well in the New York context? Would this work well with the, in the context of the other galleries that are coming this year? Um, so in a way, I think you save the risk that you're talking about, Lisa, when you say, um, you know, let's, let's make sure that there is uh, an appetite for, for this presentation and that we feel there's, there's already 
uh, an ability to bridge support for that presentation. Um, but it's coming through a very knowledgeable curatorial vision. Um, and I think it's very important that I stay out of that conversation as a gallerist and uh, as an organizer. I think it's important that that conversation happen purely between the curator and the gallerist. And, you know, we rotate 30% of our galleries every single year for that very reason. We don't want to put the pressure on galleries to feel that they lose their seat at the dinner table if they if they take a year off and that somebody else is going to be there. I mean, that is not our intention. This is supposed to be very um, fostering of of uh, the needs of gallerists year to year and um, the projects that will work for uh, for the locations that we're active in. I, th I, 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 I sort of feel that it all, it's all about context. That mm -hmm. if you're in a city like London or New York where essentially it's incredibly difficult for a young gallery to, to get people in because yeah. you, know, you might have to start off with a space, a, yeah. a, you know, a space kind of out of the center or away from other galleries. I just don't know how long you're going to have to wait, not you know, building up a great program, but mm -hmm. it's so difficult to get people to come to those galleries. And then, so you kind of, at the moment, you, you've got to have art fairs. You've just kind of got to get on into that art fair cycle so you get known. I don't know how else you do it, because footfall is just not enough now. It doesn't exist, I don't think. I, I, certainly not in London. That's another question there. Yes, hello, um, Vanessa. I have a question for you. I'm really a fan from uh, collabor collaborations. So we are uh, based in Belgium, which is a small land. So we collaborate with all the museums, with a lot of uh, colleagues uh, from us. So we opened a gallery in a new place in Antwerp, which is only 200 meters from all the museums and from um, other galleries. And as I uh, explained yesterday, we hired a place 500 square meters divided in three. And uh, so we have a central reception and there are two possibilities to see an exhibition. And during um, the Antwerp Art Weekends, we invited, uh, and also we're gonna invite this year, several uh, galleries uh, all over the world to come to this place and to be there. And um, I always explain uh, happiness, um, um, life is better when shared. Huh? And I always, always uh, use the metaphor um, um, if we eat pizza, we all have kind of an experience together. The thing is, um, if I'm hungry, I give me your part. Like you just mentioned um, uh, about the sales you did. Huh? And I think uh, the largest challenge is to find um, galleries who have the same mind. And I see that's very, very difficult because everyone, everybody wants to eat pizza. But if you're hungry, I'm not sure if everybody wants to give. So I'm, I'm wondering how you make a selection, that's first. And the second part is, um, I see we want all collaborations, but for example, if a client from me comes into our gallery and he wants to buy something from my colleague, they come to me and they said, is it fine? I buy something, what do you think? Is it good quality and those things? And I said, for sure, because it's good for him, it's good for me as well. But I think um, we speak about collaborations, but it isn't so obvious, I think, for the clients, but also for other galleries. And I'm wondering, all of you, how do you uh, deal with that? Do you have suggestions for me to, to, uh, yeah, to work with that? Uh, to answer the first question about how I make the selection, so I only do it in London. I choose the hosts, and that's based on organic conversations, relationships, p galleries who might be really big galleries but who have a similar uh, ethos, I would say. And then how we select the visitors, it's a mixture of like some of the host galleries being like, oh, I really want to work with my friend, this gallerist from this city, fine. And other galleries saying to me, surprise me, like give me a list of young galleries that I never heard of before. And so it's an organic process. In other cities, the way that I split the labor with Condo is that I don't pretend to know the art scene in Mexico and in Shanghai. So each city has its own counterpart to me, a gallerist who knows the scene well, and I trust them to choose their hosts. And you know, and for example, this year in Mexico City, it's quite exciting because the galleries that we're going to host were, you know, 
really good kind of international circuit galleries, but then because of the earthquake, they had a big meeting and decided they didn't want to exclude anyone, that it was more important for the city that um, to bring energy back to all the galleries. So I think every gallery in Mexico City is doing it this year. Um, and, and I think that, you know, that's more important to me than it being a, a kind of um, selection. But, you know, how we find each other, like, I think it's a very natural, organic thing. Like, I could, I will not name these. There's many galleries that I would never invite to do condo because they uh, don't generally operate in a collaborative way. They don't generally demonstrate that, you know, and we all know who they are because we share artists with them or we, you know, like, and, and so it's it's almost like a self selective self, you know, you organically come together because you share a similar mindset. Uh, and I think that that's the same with the collectors you end up working with, the same with the artists you end up working with. Like if an artist doesn't understand that, I don't want to work with the artist, you know, if it's about like, what can I give you? And you don't think you have to give anything back. So I, um, I don't know how else to describe it, but the same organic way that you form all the relationships in the art world with your artists, your collectors and your uh, colleagues. Okay. I think showing, showing collectors that galleries like to work with one another and putting, I mean, the, the amazing number of exhibitions, even crossing different specialities, um, historical with contemporary, that galleries get together and do. I think every single time something like that happens, I think the public l really like it. I think that they, we're not really in a particularly competitive business because we're all doing our own thing, working with our own artists. And I think that gives them a lot of sense of confidence in the integrity of each of these different elements that make up the art world. So um, it's, a very po it's an incredibly positive message. And one of the things that we're looking at with Cromwell Place is that is choosing different galleries across different specialities and kind of allowing them the space to come up with their own programs during the year or you know, bringing another group of galleries that they feel comfortable uh, showing alongside into the space at the same time. And I think that makes it more interesting as an event. And you, it opens up an awful lot of new possibilities. So it's a good and, thing. And do you, um, just one more question, do you uh, contract? Because last year we had a few of, I think we had three, 4,000 visitors only on our, um, in our gallery and also <coughs> only during the weekends and also in the other galleries. For example, also the patrons came from different museums in London and it was great, it was a great venue, mm. so we did very well. But then, for example, if it goes about sales, for me, it's obvious. If you sell, it's great, it's great for everybody. But suddenly there were... Uh, galleries who want to collaborate and there was kind of a, not a fight but discussions so I'm wondering how far are you going with all the, the rules because I'm very open for a lot of things and you, you contract a lot of things but not really everything you know what I mean? Well, I can only answer for condo like there's never been any disputes because uh, each gallery makes 100% their own sale and people understand the nature of how those client relationships work when they come to the space. Um, so we haven't had that problem. And in terms of the competition, something that um, John was saying is like, I also think that unless you're on a very, very high level, the idea of compet, you know, like if, if someone buys something uh, for $10,000 from me, they're not gonna not buy something else for $10,000 from someone else. Like I really think that, I think competition only really happens on like the highest level where like, are you going to buy the Jeff Koons from like Larry Gagosian or are you going to buy it from David Zwerner? Like, you know, because you're not going to spend that 50 million twice or something. jean I, I have a question uh, that is a little bit related to that. Uh, uh, <laughs> Vanessa mentioned fees that are very it's moderate. Yeah, oh, Vanessa mentioned fees that are very moderate. Uh, is it financially sustainable? This, this well, and how it is. If, uh, if 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 it's not, then how do you finance it? And the same to, to it's Elizabeth. financially sustainable in as much as like all the galleries are paying the rent anyway. All the galleries are going to have an exhibition anyway. Um, well, for whom? For me as an organizer. 
this is the thing like over the three years like this is like I do it all myself with like my two employees you know like the way that we've devised like the workload it's pretty simple the th to be honest the only thing that's annoying that takes the longest is the party guest list because each gallery can invite 20 people <laughs> and they want to change all their guests like up to the last minute that's the only thing that causes me like time the rest of the time it's like pretty quick to match them I sent two emails only, and the email starts with, I'm only going to send you two emails, you know? So, um, because I know what it's like to do fairs and get 50 emails. So, uh, it's actually very streamlined. I don't need anything more. I just enjoy doing the project. Uh, part of the restriction, the good thing, but the bad thing about Condo is that it can never be scaled up very much, otherwise you lose everything that's good about it. So, it'll always only have, you know, around 20-ish venues and up to 50 galleries taking part. But that's okay because there's plenty of fairs you can go and see like 500 galleries. Like Honda doesn't need to be the same. Um, and so in terms of it being sustainable, it certainly is sustainable as an organization, a project, because the idea is that we're all sharing our resources. Everyone who's participating is sharing their space or their mailing list or whatever. So it's self-sustainable. And in terms of it being commercially viable, Again, it's like gallery to gallery, you know, like some galleries sell during condo, others don't. I don't think that has much to do with condo itself. It has to do with, you know, today if you call up 10 galleries in London, some made a sale this month, some didn't. Um, I also don't think it has to be commercially viable as, as an entity. I think it has to be commercially viable for the gallerists individually. Uh, that's the goal. And, this, it, and if it isn't, you know, I don't think any of us are looking to build a second career running an entity. That's, it's, it's, you know, it came out of a very organic uh, sense of consensus at the time and place in which these projects were formed. And uh, if, if there's, if there's a, a demand for them, which there is, it will continue. And I think you really have to almost go with that as your key model and not lose sight of, of that because everything else is about it being a business. And uh, I don't think that it's useful to look at it in that metric of success. Um, I think it's more about the individuals themselves. Hi. Um, one thing I find remarkable about Condo is really this idea of self-organizing and self-applying the knowledge and the network that we have and share. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a bit about the, this idea of you know, expanding Condo as a concept because in usual art fair um, circuits, it's usually they sell or they buy another entity. And from what I understand, it's basically people from you know, the condo family or something who say, hey, we'd like to do it in our city. And then you just, what do you, you know, you just tell them, okay, go for it. Or So there is not really this commercial entity behind that, you know, asks for, has ownership on anything or, or how, how do you work with that? Yeah, I think that again, it's that organic thing of like, I had in my head the idea of the ideal cities that I would like to have condo in. I strategically kept inviting galleries from those cities, hoping that someone would enjoy doing it in London and would be like, hey, maybe I should do it in my city. And that happened, which is great. That's exactly what I wanted was New York and Shanghai. Um, and I think it's no coincidence that the organizers in all the other city are women, sorry. <laughs> and um, But the, yeah, very much like was approached by those galleries because they just get it and they s think similarly. And um, and then the labor is split. So like they, they will often consult with me, what do you think about this? What do you think about that in their own cities? But I leave them to it. And again, it's this idea of collectivism. So like the labor is shared. They look after their their project in their city. Uh, we, we discuss it together, but um, yeah, I, I think the self-organizing aspect of it is really important because it's like like-minded uh, colleagues just like find each other almost. And are there cities that you've said, I don't think Condo would be a good fit? Yeah, many, like many cities, um, you know, but, but, but it's really sweet. Like for example, in Warsaw, they wanted to do Condo there um, because Condo has to be generous from every, perspective. For me, it's a lot about generosity. So I'm not going to ask someone to fly across the world, even if they're not paying anything barely to participate. And then they're not going to meet any curators or any collectors. Like it has to be cities that have a really healthy audience already. And so a city uh, like Warsaw, um, 
I shared all my organizational documents with them. I explained the structure and I said, you know, do your own thing. Like, they've got a different name for it and it's exciting. They've asked me to come and visit it or whatever. And, and they're working in partnership with, with, um, with the the city council there or whatever. There's a couple other cities or like, you know, two of the people who did condo in 2017, they then did a version in Cologne. Hmm. Um, okay, okay. Yeah, and so there's a, f there's, and there's a few other um, cities where, again, like wh where it doesn't make sense for me from, a, from what I, how I see condo, like I encourage them to, if they want to replicate the model to like go for it, but it's just, not something that I have an interest in developing for for the way that I like envision condo. Question there. Um, I just wanted to ask a question about the avant-garde, and I f I'm wondering is there any place for that in the art fair model? When I'm listening to you speak, Elizabeth and Vanessa. I'm getting tired already of like hearing all the organizing you have to do. And then it starts reminding me of all the previews that are in my inbox right now and how exhausted I am. And then I'm thinking about Bridget Donahue, who basically has a gallery for very non-commercial artwork, but who's very well respected. Um, and she's kind of just sitting tight there. And I'm craving not getting on an airplane and not going to 20 different art fairs or even one art fair in my backyard because it's just too overwhelming. Is there a slow food movement like is there a place for is there a place where we might go back to galleries again and you know just stay in our local communities and 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 see that and and if not is there a place to be revolutionary inside an art fair <laughs> i love the idea of the revolution inside the art fair that's good uh you know, it's it is uh, it's an open platform, and as long as the I can only speak from independence perspective, uh, the creative genesis of these amazing commissioned presentations that the galleries do is a germination of today's version of the avant-garde, which is the studio conversation, the conceptual conversation. The, uh, which leads to a massive investment on the gallery and artist to bring something into being that didn't exist prior. Uh, the fact that most of the artwork that's not historical and independent is commissioned by gallerists in partnership with the artists specifically for the presentation of independent is something we're very proud of because it means that um, this isn't about taking pre-existing inventory and flying it around the world and forcing other people to fly around the world to look at it uh, when they really could just walk across the street and visit each other in, in the gallery. Uh, this is really about um, the work driving uh, the methodology for the presentation and then that also being something that comes into being through a shared uh, space. I also feel that you know, going back to the new models that we were talking about earlier, um, a gallerist doesn't have to have a brick and mortar space because just as it's tiring as it is to do art fairs, it's also tiring to have to have a 10-year lease that you're personally guaranteeing with your, with your life savings. Um, and I really do feel that the gallery is more than just individualized spaces. It's, it's the community that, they, that gallerists create with each other and, them, and their audience. It's the, it's the relationships they have with the artists and with their collector base. And the way that they uniquely individualize bringing all that together for that exchange. And so to me, uh, some galleries have more of an active gallery culture inside the fair than they maybe do on a day-to-day -day basis in the middle of January uh, you know, in their space uh, when there's maybe five people come through the exhibition in the afternoon just to see it. And there isn't a, a dialogue. They're left alone to have their own private time with the work. And, and so I think there's a lot of opportunity. I think we have to kind of get out of this over-classification system of gallery and fair. And this is, you know, this is meant to work together. This is the private gallery marketplace that we're trying to kind of 
reclaim. It's not the marketplace you see at Christie's and Sotheby's. It's not the attention-grabbing headline in the New York Times about the art market. This is, this is the exchange value of what we do. And I think that there, it is in some ways radical, but it's also very inventive. Um, and the talent is in the room. Um, I think that I would agree that there is an appetite. I certainly am like starving for this idea of like a slower uh, uh, movement. And I think that, you know, for me the, personally, for my gallery, the dream would be to do like maybe, you know, two big Basel fairs a year and like two or three smaller independent self-organized type of projects, whether they be fairs or be condo. And that's it. Like I would love to do no other fairs. Um, throughout the year, because those are the two experiences that I want. Um, one that's kind of a kind of global, huge outreach thing, and the other that's like this more personal exchange. And I agree with you; like it's exhausting. Like we're all exhausted by it, and um, it's not. It's but when it comes to space for avant-garde, like in my case, I still treat fairs, like especially the big ones as the one time that like 100,000 people are gonna see my presentation. And I really try and um, deal with each booth as a show. I don't think about it for better or for worse, maybe it's stupid of me, but I don't think of it as much as like, how much stock am I gonna be able to shift this fair? Because I'm a younger gallery, it's about like, how many people can I introduce this work to in, in its most powerful form? So sometimes I've done extremely and commercial uh, art fair presentations, and I think there's still room to be avant-garde there because you do this kind of experimental presentation that's uncommercial, but you hope that that's how you introduce the work of that artist, and then the sales happen throughout the years. So I think there, I think there is room still in the fairs, but there's definitely, in my opinion, like way too many fairs, and they're not delivering. And you can look at the list, like from one year to another, a fairs list of participants will be like super great dogs dinner, like the next year, you know, because people are getting fed up, and amongst our colleagues, like we talk, like like there's some fairs that, um, yeah, that are, are basically giving away free booths right now. So yeah, and it's breaking that cycle, that, I mean, I think a lot of galleries with the combination of fairs and gallery shows with a permanent space, you become a bit of a slave to the calendar. You know, you've got this perpetual cycle of, you know, a fair this month and a gallery show and talking to galleries, it's, it's, it's lovely to have that option, just as you're saying, where you have the freedom to do the shows to really spend a lot longer thinking about exhibitions and to be freed of having to do something every month or every six weeks. It's really hard work, and uh, I would have thought that the quality and the attention that you're going to get in those exhibitions is going to be so much better being away from that perpetual cycle. You know, when I moved to Harlem, it was a lo that was definitely the situation. Um, you know, being able to... I felt let out of my Chelsea cage when I moved. <laughs> to Harlem and uh, was so lucky to find um, an abandoned uh, former museum space that I worked on for about a year and worked with the city on for uh, to kind of clear space for us that we could occupy. Um, and this first thing I said I wanted to do was to slow down. I wanted to just go through every idea for exhibition I had ever had with an artist or a historical topic that i had been reading about for years. and figure out which one, which of those shows really were relevant to the audience that I was engaging with there. And that was just such a wonderful luxury that I had never had the opportunity to do in my tiny Chelsea space that I had been in for 15 years. <laughs> and being a destination is challenging. Um, you know, we end up really organizing things uh, well in advance and keeping shows up for, you know, two months. Our last series of shows were two and a half months. But what was nice is that you know you sit down with people and you have the conversation one on one and you have the opportunity to um, to bridge thinking and to really kind of get into the topic um, of of the exhibitions in a way that that five week cycle is is still a little bit too short for. Um, but that said, you know now I'm you know and even independent for me was a way to set up a dream context for how I would like to participate in an art fair, mm -hmm. something that felt more manageable. That was, I wanted collectors to come in and f remember what they had seen, not be completely bombarded with the magnitude and the, you know, tremendous, uh, you know, thousands of artworks that no eye retina can have, like, a visual memory for. And 
uh, and to really get back to the choreography, what it means to, to have a journey by looking at things and to be able to do it with peers of, of, of generation as well. So I think that you know, we're, there's a lot of space to create things that work and it's individual and you go through chapters and stages as a gallery, what you need in the first seven years isn't what you need in the second seven years. Mm -hmm. And there's also these micro kind of time periods that also kind of shift the focus. The kind of artist you're working with um, can also uh, really dictate a lot of things. Are there, um, can I just add one other thing that you were saying about with a fair, you've got a huge number of people coming through. And it's also about using, you can save time by being kind of more efficient with your time. I mean, if you've got, mm -hmm. you know, if you're, if you're waiting for, if people are coming to visit the gallery in dribs and drabs and they're getting, you're getting like 10, 15 a day, you, your show is therefore going to be much longer. If you can have a shorter exhibition in a week or two weeks and you're going to be seeing 5,000 people coming through, that's going to be so much more efficient use of your time. Your artists are going to be seen by more people. And you've suddenly got a lot more time to do fairs if you want to do research, to plan projects. What you were saying, John, is you have the ability to, to keep your shows up longer at home if you're taking a space at Cromwell for a week and doing a show there. Mm. It's sort of allowing different kinds of um, uh, economies and, and exposures to take place simultaneously. So having a home base that can go as long as you need it to go for the, for the show that you have on is great. I think that the bricks and mortar thing is still important because I see it with my artists. Like, you know, the first artist will be like, can I paint the floor red? You're like, sure. Then this, the artist see the show. Then the next artist, can I build 15 walls? Yeah, sure. The next wall artist, like, can I build all the walls and paint the wall green and the floor? You're, and it, it takes on this, like, collective memory of a space. And each artist sees the possibility of the last exhibition, and it somehow compounds. And I think that that's really important. Like, I... <laughs> I still think the space is important and for people out of town to come and visit you and know where to find you like, mm. and to have that physical experience. Like I personally don't, I think it's exciting to be able to have this freedom to try different spaces, different projects. But for me, the base is the base, it's the home, you know, and for the artists and for me. And I think that what's not important is to pay a fortune and be in the most expensive neighborhood for sure. Like you don't need that to put on amazing shows. Questions? It's for Elizabeth. Like the list, of, the list of exhibitors in New York this year, it's gonna be like mostly Europeans and Americans. There is one like the Stravesia Quattro only. I was wondering um, uh, you, uh, why you like just focusing more in Europe and United States in, for independent? We're a very small fair, and so to develop context between galleries that are already collaborating with artists, already collaborating with uh, points of view, collaborating with shipping, collaborating with all those things, once you end up bringing the European region, which is not small in terms of countries, um, and you bring the UK into it, which we've always had a very big presence, and then you have you know, the New York galleries doing special <coughs> projects, his, often historically relevant projects at the fair. Um, we are always dealing with the demand for the, that fair particularly and for the amount of space that we have and we don't wanna get bigger. So that's where the rotation from the beginning has always been. But we have a, a, you know, a balance of that. We have had galleries from other regions, the Middle East, uh, and also we do have Latin American galleries. Um, it just depends on, on the year. And by the way, that's not my decision. That is the decision of, of Matthew Higgs, the curator of Independent. One last question? Um, okay, one last question. Uh, I, I have a gallery in a small city in uh, Canada and we are off the beaten track in a country that's invisible. At least it feels that way. Um, and so we struggle with a lot of things. And one of the triggers for me to think, OK, I can, I can actually open a gallery here and try and make a go of the kind of program I want to put together was, um, was independent. Um, and it was also a fair. I think that Elizabeth was involved with Seven in Miami. Were you involved with the Seven Fair? I'm familiar with the Seven Fair, but I, I wasn't personally involved with it. OK. So um, I guess first, 
accommodations for finding other ways to do things. We've tried, we focused on doing nothing but solo presentations at fairs for the past four years um, as a way of trying to launch our artists, not to necessarily collectors, but the curators and the institutions that have no idea that we exist. Um, and I've tried pop-up projects in other cities in Canada, where we've done one in LA, we're working on other projects and that sort of thing. Um, but it's difficult to get, say, on Matthew Higgs' list, like anywhere on the radar, or, or condo or anything else from a place like that. Do you have suggestions for galleries who are way outside of the centers? I d so, sorry, I was just going to add that I actually think that's a huge advantage. And I have colleagues like, you know, like Rodeo Gallery used to be in Istanbul. And Sylvia, who runs it, said that every curator that came by like came to her gallery, and then she moved to London, and nobody comes anymore. Like I think that um, there's actually there can be a huge advantage to be the the big fish in the small pond. So I don't, I see it the other way around. Like I think it's much harder. You're like in London or New York or Berlin. You're like, you know, scraping by and like trying to get. There's like 200 galleries people can go and visit. So. I would have thought that if, if a gallery has a strong program, that it's a huge advantage to... And you see galleries strategically doing that all the time, like opening up in cities where there's like no other competition for that reason. I would agree. I, I would definitely agree with that. I mean, there's a whole sense of you can develop a, such a specific point of view because there's no noise around you. So you can really sharpen your you know, identity and it's not in contrast to six other galleries in town. You know, you have that, you have that, you know, really unique opportunity uh, to communicate. And to, I think telling the story of the program um, is really important. Um, and that's, obviously you're doing that through the exhibitions, but it's also through the communication with in international curators uh, who are working on these projects uh, with us. Um, and I think that over time, these, these, these things do align. I think you're, you said you're four years? Yeah, five years. Yeah, I think it's, it's really, you know, it's yeah. the beginning. And also you have to do shows over that period in order to, to gestate what you think your true foundation is. And I think allowing yourself that time uh, to incubate the program, I think will really, uh, when, when, when you now have more uh, invitations than you have the ability to, to say yes to, which, you know, will happen in the next stage, you'll, you'll feel like you have a fully formed identity and you're able to, to translate that regardless of what you decide to do. Yeah, I think there's so much potential also, like if you're in one of those cities, you can work with any artist basically, because yeah. they're not taken. You can literally, and you see galleries doing that, like a gallery in a random place will literally like go to Rena Spallings and like take their whole program to some new place and then, and then they're on everyone's maps, you know, I think that, um, it, it, the program speaks louder than anything and if you have a strong program and you have all these advantages going for you where like you're the only applicant from X country or X city for an art fair and you have the strong program and you can work with like this super desire like sought after artist that doesn't have representation in your country like I would see all of those things as a huge advantage personally. Okay. I'm afraid we'd have to stop. Yes. Thank you so much to our panelists. Thank, Thank you. you.